you think of the great cities in the world, or the small ones, Paris, Rome, New York, or your hometown, each of them has a particular character. Uh, when they grow naturally over time, they develop a personality, a lifestyle, uh, and a unique quality that we can appreciate as, as people. If all environments appear exactly the same, then this rich quality of life is lost. You can imagine I came to Tsinghua in 1986. At that time, actually, China was just at the beginning of the opening up with a lot of information coming from the outside of the country. And uh, everybody was excited about the reform. We were driving around and we saw building after building after building that was tall and empty. So basically, there's this huge amount of um, infrastructure and space that's being constructed that people aren't yet living in. So I saw a lot of the neighborhood, traditional neighborhood, being tear down. And I think this is not right. So uh, we need to do something to protect the city. But to modernize a city doesn't mean you have to erase the past, and that you have to start over. We have never seen this amount of urbanization over such a short period of time. And it's not ending. In the next 15 years, uh, two or three hundred million more people will move from the countryside into the cities of China. We will have to, in China, build the equivalent of the entire built fabric of the United States as it currently exists over the next 20 years. After the Cultural Revolution in the late 70s, uh, the faculty returned and wanted to reopen the School of Architecture. These included pioneering figures like Wu Langyang and uh, Zhu Zhishuan. And at that point, they reached out to MIT to see if a relationship could be reestablished. In uh, 1985, the first group of uh, US professors and students came to China. The students and the professors work together to facing the real problems in China urban area. MIT might be the first international university coming to China and setting up collaboration with Tsinghua University. Over the years, we've looked at probably the whole sequence and history of urbanization as it has occurred in Beijing. In the past 30 years, Beijing has been transformed from a small and traditional city to a modern metropolis. At the same time, we have to recognize that we made some mistakes. I remember in 1987, the first modern hotel was really on the outskirts of the city. It was the Great Wall Hotel. And you took a taxi cab there that had a revolving restaurant on the top. There were people selling rugs on the street. Uh, behind it was a kind of agricultural area. When we came back, I couldn't find the hotel. I couldn't find the hotel because it was on a fully developed street <laughs> with six lanes of traffic and part of an urban fabric, and it was shocking. I would like to take this opportunity to introduce this morning's speaker, who is an outstanding uh, architect, tour guide leader, and has become a very close friend. So let's have it. So uh, in our first 20 years, in the collaborations uh, in the uh, Beijing studio, we did much uh, on the traditional neighborhood, how we're going to update the traditional neighborhood and how to modernize it.
has touched on one way or another is that the physical living conditions for these people needs to be changed in some way, shape, or form. That the physical environment itself leaves a lot to be desired. We looked at one home, for example, of the ice cream salesman, whose greatest concern in life is only to sell more ice cream. They have meal together. There's a three generations. It was a neighborhood in transition because they were starting to move some of the residents out of this this neighborhood. The Hutong was a social entity, and people knew each other and they took care of each other. Now they live in high rises outside the fifth. Six Fourth Ring Road. 2006, in fact, it was astounding. We were here for a month. In that period, I saw the demolition of a hutong. And when we were there, it was being condemned. And by the time we left, it was gone. Traditional practice was to clear either existing neighborhoods or take over agricultural land and erect new towers in the park. They are isolated, they're separated, they're objects in space that have no connection. What I see happening here by the planning is the same thing. These are objects that are not really related to each other. And what I see happening this afternoon, which is so much more exciting, is a meshing of everything. Streets, houses, people, tourists, facilities, commercial, and so on. And that to me is, a, is an incredible, powerful notion of a movement, which is, as I said earlier, is contradictory to the whole modernist movement of separation. Bringing things back together probably could only happen now in history. It's coming back together. And that's a real change. So it almost, to me, I feel like some history is taking place this afternoon. <laughs> We always try to understand the local wisdom. Is there any good idea already existing there? That's why we study other built up areas to understand the community and the culture. When you move people from a, a traditional lifestyle into high rise apartments, you not only change their physical life, but also the social life as well. The social relationships, the ability of parents and children and aunts and uncles to live on the same hutong are gone. There was this one man that we talked to. He was a, an elderly gentleman sitting on the side of the kind of alleyway. He first engaged us in conversation by saying, where are you from? Who? You? Where are you from? And so we walked over and said, oh, you know, we're from an international team. We're from these countries. He said, oh, good. You know, what are you doing here? And so we started to talk about the project. And he says, you know, those are my grandkids in the street. And then he thought and he said, no, those are my great grandkids in the street. We said, wow, your great grandkids, you know, if you don't mind, how long have you lived here? He'd lived here his whole life and he's 91 years old. So he had seen this village that used to be on the outskirts of Taiyuan then be engulfed by Taiyuan. First it was fields, it was agriculture, then it got more developed, higher story buildings, and then pretty much now today, it's this, he's engulfed by skyscrapers on multiple sides. The uh, urban village issue is a real social economic issue for China's urbanization. It's not sensible, it's not correct just, you know, replace them 
to other places to give the land to more expensive land uses uh, to make profit. Rather than, you know, rebuilding, I think sort of in, in many ways the more difficult challenge is to figure out what are the other things that you can do to, to help make living in that neighborhood better for people. And one of the things that we documented in Taiwan was the real vitality of this place as a place to live, to work. And what we proposed was to regenerate this area, preserving many of its good qualities while providing a more up-to-date environment, better services. Creating higher density, multi-level courtyards, bigger spaces, but also more intimate spaces too for people to interact. A network of smaller spaces so that at every scale of, of the city, you have a green core. There has to be some sort of um, uh, deliberate long-term planning in order to accommodate people. Otherwise, the cities are not going to be the place of opportunity. They're going to be a place of, uh, let us say, mixed misery. How are you going to build up a, a real mixture rather than just build anything for the new rich group? And that's a real test for planners and also for decision makers. What we're proposing is not only new models, uh, but also a different way of thinking about what a progressive 21st century city is. concerns about energy security and greenhouse gas emissions and desire for clean energy um, development paths, we came upon the idea of building into the studio a research agenda that focused on energy um, and how you can design cities for lower energy development. We then were designing building types that really stepped and staggered and opened up to create a variety of social spaces as well as ideally much more sustainable forms. One of the very interesting, just as an example, schemes that uh, the, the studio has proposed is to bring together the qualities of traditional cities, the hutong, uh, on the ground level, but introduce high-rises uh, to increase the density. This makes them more energy efficient, but it also puts back into the model all of the um, activities and life that one would hope to find in an urban setting. Hybridizing the beneficial elements of those different forms pay homage to the past, but do so in an innovative way of looking at the future. All the teams look at the site from the ground up and try to discover what was unique about the place and have the design come out of the place, which is pretty remarkable because when you first look at this place, you say there's nothing there <laughs> to come out of. So the fact that you can discover the value of this place, and every place has a value. Every place in the city is valued by someone. You try to discover that value and then make a form out of it, and the set of activities is amazing. China is a little bit special because you have a very, very powerful communist party and the, the plan is like, it's not detailed to people, to this level. It is just like how many railway you will build, how many highway you need to add to the, the existing system. And then that's like things about numbers. It's not about living, living the life scene here. We need to do more things about the human skill. So we have to study or research or learn more about precedence. We have to focus on much more the Chinese style or Chinese 
character, a special status. It's quite different from other countries, I believe. I joined in a group of ladies dancing one night in this parking lot outside the, the, the old stadium in Taiyuan. And it's so cool that people just kind of gather, someone brings a speaker and they start dancing together. I don't know, that, that kind of... And yet, if you look at it just from kind of a Google Earth view, you see a parking lot. You don't have an idea of kind of the nuances of how that space is used kind of over the course of a day. The thing that I notice most in China is there are so many different choices to make along the way about how China can and will urbanize. So there's one story that says that China, all that's happening is China's urbanizing fast. Fast. You hear that on the radio, you see that in the news, that's what everybody describes China as. But really, I think when you come down to it, it's that choices are happening all over the place and layering on each other. It's not only fast, it's happening in a really complex way. How can we imagine a new space, in particularly in China, but also more globally for the world too? Thank you.